So good to see everybody here, and uh, it's going to be a great, great day. Um, do want to take just a moment and welcome our Shaw campus. Could we give it up for our Shaw campus? Love you guys. Hope you're doing well down there this morning and all of our online campus as well and our brothers at Stepping Into the Light. One more time, let's just welcome everybody that's joining us today. So glad you guys are here. Amen. Amen. Wow. This last weekend was really, uh, really amazing. Uh, Christmas Eve here at the Tivoli. Uh, had a couple of uh, Christmas Eve services and all of that. So a huge thank you to uh, the Dream Team and everybody that served uh, to make that a really, really special night uh, for so many people. Did you guys get to see the live animals? Anybody see live animals? Yeah? Kids were dragging you over there and that kind of stuff. So excited to have a camel this year. It was amazing. I went out there and I talked to it for a little bit and I said, listen, I've never been on a camel. I've never ridden a camel. And he looked at, back at me like, are you joking me right now? So I did not ride the camel. I'm just saying. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it was a great, great night. So thank you so much for everybody that, uh, that helped out with that. Uh, a couple more things to dive into just uh, before we get into the Word of the Lord. Don't forget, uh, January the 9th, so two Sundays from today, right here at this campus, we're going to be going to two services on Sunday morning. You'll have two different, two different times you could come, which is really great, right? Because 9 o'clock, for all you early birds, you can get here. And those of you who, you know, are not early birds, 10.30 right here, 9 o'clock at 10.30. Of course, our online service will be at 9 o'clock in the morning, uh, and then our Shaw campus will be still having their service at 10 a.m., so uh, just be aware of that. And then also on January the 9th, so that's two weeks from today, uh, our membership class, Next Steps, uh, is going to be at the Shaw campus, a great dinner, 5 o'clock in the evening with the staff, and uh, you don't want to miss that. If you're new to One Family Church and you want to get connected and involved, I encourage you to jump into that, so you'll get more information about that but uh, yeah, let's, let's get into the word of the Lord this morning. You guys ready for the word a little bit? You guys just kind of ready? You awake? Got your caffeine on? You have been drinking it down? Okay, all right. <clears throat> yeah. So, we're, you know, we're wrapping up this year, and I've been, you know, wondering exactly what is on everybody's mind, because, you know, all of us probably are in different places, but we all are experiencing many of the same things. And so I was thinking, you know what, probably what people are thinking about is the pandemic, right? That, that's one big thing. Or maybe you're thinking about uh, politics, what's going on with all of that. Maybe you're thinking about, you know, the economy and what's happening with all of that. Where's that going? Or maybe, uh, maybe you're just kind of like, wow, the holidays are here and maybe that's a big deal for you in and, and, and good ways and maybe for some in not so good ways and all of that. So I've just been kind of wondering, what is everybody really thinking about? What are you processing? And I think that I have figured it out. Uh, apparently, what people are thinking about is Superman, or Spider-Man, or Batman, or any other superhero right now. Spider-Man just came out 10 days ago. Let's have a moment of confession. Has anyone seen Spider-Man yet? Wow, more people than saw the live animals. That's, that's amazing. Okay. So, yeah. So Spider-Man, I haven't seen it. This is No Way Home. Think about this. It came out 10 days ago. It's not streaming. It's only available in theaters. And yet, in the last 10 days here in the United States of America, it's brought in almost half a billion dollars. And globally, it's already at almost a billion dollars. So apparently, people are thinking about Spider-Man right now. Okay? So I don't, I don't know what your youth was like. Maybe you grew up in a different way. I grew up in a season, in an age of superheroes. And I think it's a big deal right now. I mean, it just keeps, I mean, how many, like 37 Avenger movies or whatever are out there, right? But I grew up thinking about, you know, Superman and Batman and Spider-Man. And there was a reason, and that's because we, we love the fact that these guys had some kind of superpower. You know, they had, yeah, they had capes, and some of them had masks, and, you know, a lot of them had really tight pants. But most of them had, like, a really awesome superpower. Captain America, do you guys remember Captain America? Anybody? Okay, so Captain America had speed, he had strength, he had a shield. Uh, you know, Thor, what did Thor have? Hammer, right? Uh, Iron Man, what's Iron Man got? A bodysuit, right? Armor, right? That'll fly, right? That's awesome. Wolverine, I don't know if Wolverine's a superhero, but Wolverine, I mean, the guy can heal from anything, and claws come right out of his hand. I mean, that's pretty much super. Spider-Man, what does Spider-Man do? 
He, he swings around on webs and stuff. He what? He does whatever a spider can. Oh, now the song's in my head. No. Uh, yeah, well, all of us. Well, I got to be honest with you. My favorite, and I grew up, you know, seeing black and white superpower movies. You know, Spider uh, Superman was black and white in my day. And, uh, but I love Superman because he's got the ability to fly. I mean, not, you know, he, he's not like a plane. I mean, he could just like launch off the ground. He overcomes gravity and he's able to fly. I used to have dreams of flying. I'd go to sleep. Anybody else do that? Have dreams like where you're coming up off the ground, flying a little bit? I did that, right? So I thought, what kind of superpower would I want, right? Think about it for just a moment. What would you want? Like if, if you were Superman, right? You got flying, you got the x-ray vision, you got the strength, you're pretty much indestructible, right? All of that. So what superpower would you really like? I don't know. But you know something else that almost every superhero has is that they seem to have a, a very real weakness, right? Maybe you remember some of those Superman What's the weakness of Superman? Kryptonite. See, you guys, you may watch a little bit too much TV. <laughs> Do you guys remember what the, what the original weakness of Wonder Woman was? You guys don't know, do you? It's so weird. I got to go talk to the guy who wrote Wonder Woman because the original weakness of Wonder Woman, remember she had braces? Bracelets or whatever they call, right? She would lose all of her strength if a man tied her hands together. We, yeah, we need to go back and think about, like, what was going on with that guy? Have you ever heard of the Green Lantern, right? You know the Green Lantern, right, his weakness? His weakness is the color yellow. He'd be terrified of that beanie right there, I'm telling you right now. It's like, get that banana away from me, man. I, I don't know what that is. There was another one called Galactus. Does anybody know who Galactus is? You heard of Galactus? Oh, I got a couple. I got a couple. Galactus was this, he, he, he gets this ravenous hunger, and even though he is capable of devouring entire planets and even galaxies, if Galactus gets hungry, he's done. Anybody ever been there? I got that weakness right there. <laughs> well, there's another theme that also goes with these superhero stories, right? And that's usually that there is an enemy, a really evil enemy trying to destroy or at least control the entire planet. By the way, all of this is fiction, right? But maybe you're seeing there's a parallel to another story, and this one actually is not fic fiction at all. This is a, there, there's a, there are supernatural powers, there's, there's a world that is in trouble, and the greatest hero of all time shows up as a baby. This is a superhero story. We've been, we've been celebrating it for the last several weeks, and especially over this last weekend. And I got to thinking about some of the stuff that we find in Christmas hymns, you know, the songs that we've been singing. And maybe you don't realize how incredibly theological these hymns really are, these Christmas songs. So I'm going to give you just a piece of the words out of a couple of them. So right, O Holy Night is one of them. These are some of the words from O Holy Night. It says, truly, he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. I was gonna try to sing that, but there's no way. Did you hear that, man? The superhero, this, he's breaking chains. He's setting people free. He is destroying. He's obliterating oppression. I was reading something out of God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. I was like, that, that probably doesn't have any depth to it, right? Listen to the words out of God Rest You Merry Gentlemen. Fear not then, said the angel. Let nothing you affright. This day is born a savior of a pure virgin bright to free all of those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. Oh, tidings of comfort and joy that is a superhero story right there anybody ever experience how god can set you free how god can deliver you right hallelujah amen so that's the story of a superhero well it's kind of interesting because god actually allows us to enter into the story even in powerful, powerful ways. And so I want to take you to Luke chapter 10 and just give you something to hold on to as we're wrapping up 2021. Is that what year we're in? Is this 2021? Because I heard somebody say the other day there was 2020. 
And then this year, 2021. Did you catch that? 2021. And a lot of people are living in fear because next year is 2022. That's, I threw that in for free. That's just, yeah. I want to give you something you can hold on to here, right? So Luke chapter 10, it says this. Jesus is talking to his disciples. Now remember, he sent the disciples out to do some ministry, and they, they had an incredible season of ministry. They went out two by two. They did some awesome stuff, and then they come back. And it says this, in, starting in verse 17, And when the 72 disciples returned, then uh, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. That's some power right there. And Jesus says, yes, he told them. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But then he makes an interesting statement. He says, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. In other words, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a child of the living God, you have authority over that. That's normal. This is what I want you to rejoice over. He says, rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Now, I want you to hold on to that. and We're going to come back to this statement by Jesus at the end today. But I want to jump even further back into a story that's found in the Bible and talk to you for a moment. We've talked about all these fictional superheroes. I want to talk to you about the legacy of a real superhero. And this is based on a story that uh, was written not just 100 years ago or even 1,000 years ago. This story actually goes back 4,000 years ago. The Bible is actually a collection of 66 ancient manuscripts that all come together to form one book. But this particular manuscript, this book, is possibly the oldest. Scholars say that it is actually the first book of the Bible that was ever written, chronologically speaking, and that is the book of Job. So we're going to talk about Job for just a moment. Job, you've probably heard a lot about him. You know, we talk about the patience of Job and et cetera, et cetera. Job, he he really was just a man. He did live 4,000 years ago, but he was just a man. I think he's also quite a hero, and we're going to talk about that today. I'm not suggesting, of course, that he was a superhero in that sense of the word, although he probably did wear a, a cape of some kind. But the truth is, Job is just a man. He's just like you and me. But if you were to ask Job, what is it that makes you different, maybe from those that were around him at the time, based on his faith in God, based on his perspective of God, based on his relationship with God, I believe that this is what Job would say about himself. He would say, I am a survivor. I'm a survivor. I've been punched. I've been kicked. I've had everything. I've lost everything, but I'm a survivor. I've had doubts and I've had questions, but I'm a survivor. I've been attacked and I've been criticized, but I'm a survivor. I'm still standing here. I'm still breathing. Listen, this may not sound like that big of a deal to some of us, but for many, the fact that I'm still standing here is the biggest miracle you could ever imagine. And I know I'm talking to people here today at the Tivoli. I'm talking to people at our Shaw campus and online, our brothers at Stepping Into the Light. You have been through some stuff. You have walked through some problems. You've dealt with some people. Somebody said amen. Amen. Don't look at the person next to you. Just say amen. (laughs) dealt with some people you've dealt with some sickness maybe you've had COVID maybe your family has ended up with COVID maybe you've lost some people maybe there's been deaths and doubts but you are still here you're at one family church on a Sunday morning and you're in the presence of God you're with the people of God and you're desiring a word from God you are still here enemy tried to take you out you're still standing And you're in this place. Just look at somebody next to you and tell them, I'm a survivor. I'm a survivor. That's your superpower. I'm a survivor. All right, so let me take you back to the story of this man by the name of Job. So we're going to Job chapter 1 and verse 1. 
It says, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God, and he stayed away from evil. It's a good man. He's just doing his thing, and he was blessed. I mean, this guy had, in those days, what would be considered everything, right? He had seven sons. He had three daughters. He had 7,000 sheep. Back in those days, a sheep, singular, was like a clothing store. He had like 7,000 clothing stores, right? He had 3,000 camels. Those are like, you know, 18 wheelers today. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen. Those are like John Deere tractors, right? He had 500 donkeys. The Bible says he has a very great household. He was the greatest of the people of the East. This is a good man. He's a wealthy man. He's got everything. He would, the Bible says that he would pray regularly for his children, and he would go out and he would offer up sacrifices for his children. But somewhere in chapter 1 and chapter 2, this beautiful story of this godly man turns. And this is what we begin to read starting in verse 6 of chapter 1. You guys might insert yourself into this story because this is probably going to feel like what's been going on sometimes in your life. One day the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves before the Lord. And the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from? The Lord asked Satan. And Satan answered the Lord, I have been... No, I won't do the voice, okay. <clears throat> Satan, that actually hurts a little. Satan answered the Lord, I have been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. And the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? Has anybody ever feel like God just kind of points you out to some? He said, he said have, you, have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God. He stays away from evil. Satan replies to the Lord. Yeah, I've, I've seen him. But Job has good reason to fear God. You've always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property. You've made him prosper in everything that he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out. And take away everything he has, Satan says, and he will surely curse you to your face. And God says, all right. <laughs> he says, you can test him. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses. Do not harm him physically. So Satan left the presence of the Lord. But it wasn't very long before a messenger comes running in to the presence of Job and gives him the news. Job, I am so sorry. Every single one of your oxen have been stolen. Every one of your donkeys have been stolen. All of your servants have been killed. Then another messenger comes in and says, I, I am so sorry, Job, but there's been, there's been, a, there's been a fire and, and all of the sheep have been killed and, and more of your servants are killed and then there, there's, a, there, there's a theft that happens and then there's a storm the, 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 probably the thing that hurt him the worst of all was there was a storm that destroyed the home that his children were hanging out in for the day and all ten children died. And this is when Job begins to demonstrate for us the legacy of a real, not a fictional, a real, a human superhero. And it may not look what you think it might look like. Because in Job 1 and verse 20, it starts this way. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Let me, let me just stop for a moment here because I want to I highlight the fact. I want to remind you. I'm using words like superhero. Job is a man. Job is human. And here with all of this news that has come to him, he is now hurting and he is suffering and he is experiencing a soul crushing agony that he has never felt at this level before this pain is real and he is not going to use his belief in God or his faith in God to try to mask over the pain or try to deny the hurt 
I realize as followers of God, as followers of Jesus, sometimes we do that. I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to hurt like other people hurt. I'm supposed to have faith. I'm supposed to, you know, just bury it and, you know, trust. Listen, God is okay with you being real about your pain. Sometimes the greatest faith is expressed in a life that is willing to admit how much pain you are suffering from. In fact, I encourage you sometime, get into the book of Psalms. Read the book of Psalms because it's full of what we call imprecatory Psalms. Imprecatory Psalms are those written by people who don't know why this is happening to me. And so they're actually saying things like, God, you know, Psalms is a book of songs, right? So somehow they're putting this to lyrics. God, where are you? God, why are you letting this happen to me? That's all throughout the book of Psalms. God's okay with those questions. It's all right. But this is what blows my mind. Job 1, verse 20. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief, and then he shaved his head and fell to the ground to worship. If you're taking notes, write this down because this is what the legacy of Job is all about. Number one is this, when I suffer, I lift up my worship. I lift up my worship. You know, I just talked about the book of Psalms. It's interesting because if you go back to the most ancient manuscripts of the Hebrew Old Testament, you look at their table of contents, so to speak, and the way the books were ordered in the original Hebrew Old Testament. It's interesting that the book of Psalms comes right before the book of Job. If you read your English Bible today, you'll probably see Job comes right before Psalms. But in the original Hebrew Bible, Job followed immediately after Psalms. And here's why that's interesting, because, you know, the Psalms, for the most part, it does have those imprecatory feel to it, but there's a, it's full of songs of praise and adoration and worship and all of that. And when you get down to the very end of the book of Psalms, the very last Psalm, Psalm 150, you've probably read it a million times, but it says stuff like this, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty firmament, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the lute and harp, praise him with the timbrel and dance, praise him with the stringed instruments and the flutes, praise him with the loud cymbals, somebody say loud, turn it up. That's what I'm talking about, man. Get the volume to where I, I, want, I want to feel the volume of worship to the point where my chest is kind of caving in a little bit. My pacemaker gets rebooted. <laughs> Pray, praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with the clashing cymbals. And then it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. King James Version, I heard that. Praise ye the Lord. That's literally, in the, in the Hebrew Bible, the original Hebrew Bible, that's the end of the book of Psalms, and the very next words are, there once was a man named Job. Isn't it interesting that he's describing someone, saying, look, if all you have left is breath in your lungs, then praise the Lord. And Job, the story of Job, he loses, he's got nothing left to live for except the breath in his lungs. And yet, he shaves his head, he falls to the ground, and he begins to worship. This is what he says in verse 21. He says, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. But the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't understand it. I don't know why this is happening. I don't have God's omniscient view. I don't see everything. But blessed be the name of the Lord. And it says in all of this loss, in all of this suffering, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And I think it's because Job had, he had a larger view of God. He, there, there was something about his understanding of God. He said, Lord, I, I may not know why this is happening, but, but I know that I can worship. I don't understand why I've lost this. I don't understand why I'm suffering, but... I do know how to worship. 
Listen, it's human to grieve. It's human to hurt. We're not going to deny the reality of the pain that we go through. We should not take a shortcut in the process of grief. But Job says, after I've done this, and even while I'm doing this, I will worship. Maybe your worship isn't flowery. You know, we sing some awesome songs with some awesome lyrics, man, and we declare how good God is. And maybe at home on your own, maybe, maybe you've just mastered the Elizabethan English. And maybe when you're home worshiping by yourself, you're just like, thou, oh God, art the, all of the thous and the these and stuff. Maybe you just throw that, maybe, maybe that's your worship, and I'm sure God loves every bit of that. But you know what? I read a verse one time, and this is not in your notes, but this, I love this because this is when Jesus, Jesus and his disciples were actually going to take a little bit of a vacation. They'd been ministering, they'd been working it out, and they went up to this certain this area near Tyre and Sidon, and the Syrophoenician woman comes to Jesus because her daughter has been uh, under some kind of a demonic attack. And she tries to get the attention of Jesus and there's this one statement that I just love because after, after being rejected by the disciples, they're like, hey, we're on vacation. We're not here to pray for you. We're here to rest and relax. Can you just go away? We'll pray for you after, we, you know. After all of that, she, does, she doesn't go away, number one. But then the Bible says of Jesus, it says, then she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. So maybe, maybe your worship in the moment of suffering and grief is not throwing your hands up. Maybe it's not the little dance thing going on. Maybe it's not clapping and, you know, getting into it. And all. Maybe your worship is just saying, Lord, help me. And that is worship because with Lord and me, you have connected heaven and earth. You have said, God, you are my source. You are my healing. You are my hope. Help me. Worship doesn't deny my reality. It shifts my focus onto the one who can carry my reality. So I want to encourage somebody today, as we're wrapping up this year, turn your eyes upon Jesus. You remember that one? Look full in his wonderful face. And then the things of this earth, they're going to grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. When I suffer, I lift up my worship. But let me move on, because in Job 2, the story continues. Satan, who had failed because Job still had faith in God and was worshiping, Satan appears before God again. And this time, God basically looks at him and says, Satan, what you been doing? And Satan says, I was just out for a walk. Just kind of going to and fro. This is one of the reasons why I do not walk for hell. It's like the devil. He's the one that goes to and fro, walking throughout the earth. <laughs> You're got, you guys are like, please never talk to us about how to be healthy because you have no... Satan says, I'm just out for a walk. God again says, have you thought about Job? He knows what he's been thinking about. Satan says, you know I have. I took everything, but he still serves you. And there's a reason why, because you let me take his stuff, but you didn't let me touch him. You let me touch him, and he will curse you to your face. And God says, all right. I trust Job. I believe in Job. And so I'm going to let you touch him. You can't kill him, but I am going to let you touch him. And so Satan gives Job his own personal pandemic. Boils covered every square inch of his flesh. Now remember, when this happens, Job has been worshiping. Job has been declaring how awesome God is in the middle of his suffering and in the middle of his pain. And now his body is covered in all of this. And the last remaining family member that he has, his wife, comes to him. And she comes to silence the worship. She comes to silence his voice forever. Because she doesn't just say, shut up. She says, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? I don't know if you've ever had somebody in your life that just like looks what you're going through and they're like, man, you ought to give up. 
you ought, to just, you ought to just walk away. You just ought to throw in the towel. I mean, it is over. You have gone as far as you can go, and that's it. There's no way out of this. Maybe that voice has been your own voice in your head. Job responds to his wife in verse 10 of chapter 2, and he says to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity in all this Job did not sin with his lips. So this is the next chapter of Job's legacy. Write this down. When I'm silenced, I speak up in faith. When I suffer, I lift up my worship. When I'm silenced, I'm going to speak up in faith. Proverbs 18.21, Job would not have known this verse, but this is an awesome verse. This, the, the writer of, of, of this proverb says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Listen, contextually, in Proverbs 18, where this verse is found, this is actually a king giving instruction to his son. This is a son who is going to sit on the throne as a king, and he is going to have people come before him that have been accused of crimes. And he, with his spoken word, is going to be able to look at one person and say, you are guilty and the punishment is death. And he's going to be able to look at this person and say, you are innocent and for you it's life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So that's the original context, a king sitting on a throne. But the principle can be applied to our own life. You probably have noticed this, how that with your words, you can literally kill someone in your life. Yeah, Or with your words, you can make someone come alive. If you use your words to kill someone, it's like you're a loser, you're a failure, you're never going to be anything. Don't you, you know, that's death that comes from the... Some, somebody asked me one time, like, why do you always talk about Robin like she's so awesome? And I say, well, because she is, number one. That's right. I'm 51 years old. I'm married to a supermodel. Have you seen her? When I go out in public, people are like looking at me like, that dude must be rich because. And by the way, Robin is listening right now. And the reason why I do stuff like that is not just because it's true, and it is true, but also because I've seen what happens in her eyes when I speak life to her. She comes alive. There is power in our tongue, and I want to encourage you because you can kill people with your tongue, and you can make them come alive with your tongue. And let me tell you, even when it comes to your own heart and your own faith and how you're feeling in the moment, you can either kill your faith with your tongue or you can make your faith come alive by the words of your mouth. I haven't even had coffee yet. I feel like I'm a little worked up here. But Job had this principle, when I'm silenced, I speak up in faith. So he said things like this, Job 19, 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. Job 13, verse 15. This was how, to the extent of his faith, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Him. I've got such a large view of God that even if everything goes wrong and even if I lose my life, I am still going to trust God. You know what blows my mind about faith like that? Do you remember Abraham? The Bible says in the Hebrews chapter 11, this is not in your notes, but Hebrews chapter 11 where it says that Abraham was asked to take his son to the top of the mountain and he was asked to kill his son to demonstrate his faith to God. And of course in the story, God stops him from doing that because his faith was really genuine and really real and all of that. But Abraham's faith was such, he said, I was willing to do it, not just to be obedient, but because I had faith that God could raise Raise my son from the dead. Wow. So I don't know what this looks like for you. Speaking up when you've been silent, speaking up in faith. Maybe it's words like, God, I am hurting, but I know that you are with me. I have lost everything, but my God is is alive and he is real and he loves me and he's never going to forsake me. God, I don't understand one bit of this, but I trust in you. 
I speak up. Let me give you one last one, and then I'm done. When I suffer, I lift up my worship. When I'm silenced, I, I speak up in faith. But here's the third piece of Job's legacy that blows my mind. When I've fallen, I get up again and again. And then notice parenthetically, for it's God who's giving me strength. I'm going to come back to that here in just a moment. I don't know if you remember 1985. Does anybody remember 1985? 1985 was my first time to sneak into a movie theater. I wasn't supposed to go to movies, but I did. I'm confessing it right now in public. I actually went straight home and confessed it to my dad too, but anyway. <laughs> but the very first movie that I snuck out to see was Rocky IV. Remember Rocky IV? Eye of the Tiger? I cannot tell you how many times I watched that movie and afterwards I'm like, ah. You know what blows me away about that? And I know it's just a story. But I don't know if you remember the big dude that he's fighting. And how in that fight, this guy, I mean, you know, Rocky's like this tall. And in that fight, this big dude is just like, bam, I mean, hitting him on the forehead. You guys remember this? It's like, bam, just over and over again. And once in a while, Rocky would fall down, but he would not stay down. I'm like, you know, when I'm watching this movie, I'm like, this guy is an idiot. Just stay on the floor. He will leave you alone if you just stay on the floor. And some of us feel that way about the devil. Maybe if he knocks me down and I just stay on the floor, he'll leave me alone. But the legacy of someone who has faith in God is that you can't keep me down. I am going to get up, and if I have to, I'll get up over and over and over again. Maybe I fall because I sin. I'm a professional sinner. I confess it. I do that. I'm, I'm good at it. I've been doing it for 51 years of knowing how to sin. Every time I fall, I tell God, God, you know my sin. I know my sin. I am not going to walk away from you. I'm going to get back up and keep going because I mess up. But some of you are not knocked down just because of your sin. You've been knocked down because of other people in your life. Or you've been knocked down because of the influence of the enemy. And God says, I'm going to give you the strength to get up again and again and again. You will, you will not be knocked out of this fight. Proverbs 24, 16 says, For though the righteous falls seven times, they rise again, they rise again, they rise again. The wicked stumble when calamity strikes. The righteous, when they fall, they rise again. Job's story, and I'm going to move on from that story here in just a second, but his story ends with God restoring everything. Sons and daughters and livestock and everything. I love that. You know, I realize that when some people look at us as followers of Jesus, they think, you know what, your faith is based solely on some emotional moment that you had in a church service where maybe the music was going and your emotions were stirred up, and in that moment you thought, wow, man, I really need something. And so you maybe, you know, they think we're, it's just about emotion. Or they think that our faith is based solely on the words that are printed in the book we call the Bible. And you know what? We appreciate the experience. And the Word of God is powerful. But the truth is, if you had never seen a Bible in your life, and by the way, there are people in the world today who live in countries and places that have never seen a Bible. You know they can still be saved? Because the core of our faith is not an emotional experience or even a book that we have access to. The core of our faith is a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago and was observed by hundreds of eyewitnesses. This man, Jesus, who was tormented by the devil in the wilderness, this man, Jesus, who was rejected by a nation, who was tortured and crucified by an empire, we believe because when Jesus was hit with evil's greatest threat, and that is death. He still 
got up again. Let me tell you what gives the devil nightmares. It's the resurrection of Jesus. When the devil hits him with everything he has, and it results in a cross, and it results in a tomb, but can you imagine the, the, the impact on Satan, on the devil, if he's just hanging out in the tomb on the third day, looking at this body laying here under the sheets, and maybe the sheet has slid down off the face? I just imagine this in my mind, that he's watching the very still body of Jesus lying there, and then all of a sudden, he starts to see movement under the eyelids, like somebody is dreaming, but about to come awake don't you know that Satan probably about passed out in that moment and Jesus on this third day he comes alive again you can't keep him down he's the ultimate survivor Barry come help me if you would Jesus is the hero of the story. But listen, because of him and because of the power and the strength that he gives to us, we are just like him. Paul said this, he tells believers, he says in Ephesians 6 verse 10, he says, finally my brethren, stop trying to do it on your own. Stop trying to be strong in yourself. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I'm going through some tough times. I'm going to hang on to Jesus. I feel like I'm at my weakest moment. I'm going to hang on to Jesus. I've got a faith in God that is going to go beyond anything that I can experience in this world, in my physical life. Job actually said it this way, Job 19, this blows my mind. He said, after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see. He said, if, if this pandemic, this personal thing, these boils covering my body, if they take me out, if I end up dying in my flesh, I shall see God. Even then, 4,000 years ago, Job is hinting at the idea of resurrection. He's saying, even death cannot separate us from our God. Let me take you back to Luke chapter 10 and I'm wrapping up Jesus is welcoming the 72 back and he says when the 72 disciples returned they joyfully reported to him Lord even the demons obey us when we use your name he says to them I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning look I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them and nothing will injure you but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. That's normal. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Jesus is saying this. He's saying, I'm going to give you all the power and all of the authority that you need over the enemy. But the thing I want you to hold on to, the thing that I want you to be the most excited about, the thing that scares the enemy the most about you as a child of God is that your name is registered in heaven. And that means that you are a survivor. Listen to me. God does miracles. He can set you free. He can do all kinds of stuff. I've seen him do it. He will do it. He does that in this lifetime. But listen to me. Even if the enemy hits you with his best shot, even if we pass from this life, in the end, we still win because we still survive. I want to do something a little different right now. I realize we usually stand a little bit later. But I want to invite you right here at the Tivoli to stand to your feet. If you're at the Shaw campus, I want you to stand to your feet right now. If you're at home in your living room, if you're eating leftovers from your Christmas dinner right now, stand up on your feet. You can keep your fork in your hand if you want. Because I want to end 2021 with a declaration. 
I didn't really intend to do this. This was not on purpose. As just as I'm working on this, as I'm praying about this and putting this together, I realized that something happened. It just worked out this way. Seriously, was not intentional. I'm just telling you. But we're going to declare this. I'm going to read it first. Would you put it up on the screen? These are the three points that I just shared with you. When I suffer, I lift up my worship. When I'm silenced, I speak up in faith. When I fall and I get up again and again, for it's God who is giving me strength. That was not intentional, but that sounds good. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to lift up our voice right here, and we're going to do this together. Is that all right? We're going to speak this out, and I encourage you that as you walk from this year into the next year and into whatever year comes your way in the future in your life, that you declare these words because God is with you. You guys ready? Would you say this with me? When I suffer, I lift up my worship. When I'm silenced, I speak up in faith. When I've fallen, I get up again and again, for it's God who is giving me strength. Come on, let's do it again. Do it again with some more energy. When I suffer, I lift up my worship. When I'm silenced, I speak up in faith. When I've fallen, I get up again and again, for it's God who is giving me strength. Can we give Him praise for that? (laughs) Hallelujah. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for everybody that's watching, watching guys, you at our Shaw campus. Everybody. Because I realize that there's some people in here today, maybe you're suffering and you haven't got to the place where you can lift up worship yet. God's going to give you whatever it is that you need, the strength that you need to make it through that. You've got to turn your heart to Him. Turn your faith to Him. For those of you who feel like your voice has been silenced, maybe by other people, maybe by yourself, maybe by the enemy, maybe by just circumstances that are just so heavy, it just feels like you can't even... God's going to help you open your mouth in faith. And for those of you that feel like you have been absolutely crushed, we're going to pray that God will just fill you with the Holy Spirit and His power and His strength. So would you do that wherever you're at? Just close your eyes with me right now and let's pray together. Father, right now in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for being such an awesome God. I thank you, Father, because we know that you have the strength that we need. When we're at our weakest, God, you are there and you are strong. And I pray, God, for those right now who are suffering. God, and I know they are many. Those that are listening to this word right now, there are many in this house and at Shaw and online that are suffering with things that we can't even imagine. God, I'm praying, Lord, right now in the moment that you would wrap them in your arms, God, to the point where you become so tangible to them that right there as their face is on the ground, all of a sudden worship begins to pour out of their mouth. Because, God, I know you inhabit the praises of your people. And I pray, God, as we worship, you just show up in power in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, right now for people who feel like their voice has been silenced. They've had a hard time. In fact, most of what's been coming out of their mouth lately has been death. But, God, you're going to turn their voice right now. And they're going to begin to speak the word of the Lord. They're going to begin to speak the promises of God. They're going to begin to speak in faith because they have a new revelation of who you are and what you are and what you can do. And I pray, Father, for those who today are crushed beyond any imagination. I pray for them and every single one of us, God. You said that if we would ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that you would do that. And so we ask for it today, God. Fill every one of us with your Spirit. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your strength, God. As we step out of 2021 and into 2022, God, we declare that all of the statements of the enemy, all the statements of our culture, all the statements of of politicians and everybody else that wants to paint this season a certain way, God, we declare you are the author of our faith. You are the writer of our story. And so, God, we accept that today and we declare that you are God and God alone and beside you there is no other and we bless your name today we bless your name today and we give you praise we give you praise in the mighty mighty name of Jesus and we say amen everybody would you say it amen and amen and amen hallelujah I hope you carry that word with you into this next season. I want to give you a way you can respond today, especially if you're a a first-time guest. We are so glad that you're here. 
So glad that you're in this house with us today. And I want to encourage you, on the back of your seat, uh, you'll find either a hard copy of our connection card or you'll find a QR code that you can scan with your phone. I want to encourage you, if you're a first-time guest, scan that. Let us know that you're here. We want to celebrate with you, just welcome you into this place. And get, if there's any way we can get you connected, we'll do that as well. Uh, but anybody else, you're welcome to use that as well to communicate prayer requests or what God's doing in your life. Love to hear from you in that way. Also, if you're part of our church family, One Family Church, you know we believe in the mission of bringing people and God together in love. And if you want to support that, then we encourage you to give with your tithes and your offerings. And you can do that through text message. You can do that through the website, all kinds of different ways to give. And then before you leave today, I would encourage you, another way you can respond is to stop off in the prayer room right back here on my left, on your right. Walk through there and there's a self-directed communion experience that you can walk through and just take a moment to relive the death of and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, because that's the story that changed everything. Hallelujah. But we're going to worship uh, together one more time with the worship team. Can we do that one more time in 2021? Let's lift up our voices, and let's praise God together. Can we do that? God bless you guys.